All right, well, hello, good morning. And let me just make sure, got this right here. Hmm. Does it pop up for you when I'm speaking? I just want to make sure it's uh showing my video active. If anybody can give me like a thumbs up in the chat or something. <laughs> Um, well, I'll go ahead and say um, hello. Oh, thank you, Larry. Okay. Well, good morning. Uh, welcome to our June 2023 recap. Uh, my name is Amanda, and I'm going to kick us off here today. So um, first, uh, well, actually, so we're on our June 2023 recap page. We're going to be talking through the USAS releases, um, the USPS inventory, all that good stuff. Um, before we get started on that, though, I do have one other thing that I want to um, kind of show you all. And uh, let's go back. I'm just starting at our very main homepage to get to this to show you where it is. If we scroll down here, this SSDT meetings and training page. And I'm scrolling down to our ITC only support resources and materials. So what we did is we added a new page here. Um, we're at a really uh, you know, interesting part in our process here because we're, what about six months past, um, past the migrations being over. I know we've had um, some newer people join the ITCs in the last couple of years. And so what we wanted to do is kind of go through and make this best practices just to kind of have this in one place for you all, um, for when you're submitting tickets to us at SSDT to kind of have um, that information of like what we're looking for. Um, and really the goal with this is to help with, um, to help you be able to know, you know, what we're looking for, hopefully prevent some of like the back and forth, just so that we can kind of get to our answers efficiently and effectively for you. So um, let's see here. Let me do this. Let me do just one thing here. Hang on. Okay. Okay. So um, we have a couple different sections on this page. So what I'm going to do before we go into the recap is actually just talk this page a little bit with you to show you what we have set up here. Um, just a little recap at the top, you know, uh, we're here to help as a second line of support. You know, we want to help you um, with a better understanding of the software and the tools to support your customers at the districts. So one thing to keep in mind, our answers, um, they are intended for you at the ITC. You know, we definitely know that you know your districts best. Um, so, uh, you know, with relaying that information. So sometimes we may add a little bit more for you to help you with troubleshooting that situation in the future. Um, you know, or sometimes if you have a really new user, like you might need to add a little bit. So um, really what we want to do is effectively collaborate, help get to the root of that issue and get you your answer. So first section here is general information. And what we have here is we kind of put this section of things that like most tickets, these things can be helpful if they apply. And um, we'll get down there's like the different kinds of tickets and we have a section for each of those too. Um, but just to kind of briefly talk through these, so uh, the district name, um, I know that sometimes like you're asking a general question, obviously all of these things really vary based on um, what the situation is, what the question is, right? Um, but with the district name, this can be very helpful to have up front, um, especially if your ITC is uh, has the nightly backups to management council. Um, a lot of times we do just go ahead and look at those to make sure we're getting you uh, like the most specific answer we can. Um, it also really helps with searching for us and for you. So if you have those district names in the tickets, we have search functionality that we'll um, utilize or like you have access to the ITC tickets. And so if, you know, maybe one of your coworkers put in a ticket, if they had a situation that happened a couple months ago, having the district name in the ticket would help to be able to locate something that, you know, might actually be related to whatever that district's experiencing now. So that's a really good one to just kind of put in there if it is something that applies to a specific district or districts. We have time sensitive. So of course, if there is something that 
um, affects a specific process, like if they're trying to submit something or if they um, have a check run that we're working on or a payroll tape that needs to get to the bank, definitely let us know that. We want to know those things. We want to make sure we can help you and account for that to accommodate and get to the answer, uh, make sure they can meet their deadlines. The next thing here is um, record specific information. So again, this is one if there's like a specific district that's kind of like asking about something, whether that's a purchase order or like an employee's position or um, even a specific item number and in inventory. So, you know, if there is something that you're looking at, it's helpful up front, just include the PO number, um, include the employee number, that identifying information, again, if we do have to pull a backup or, you know, if we get a backup from you, that's going to be helpful so that we can just go right to um, the record that you're looking at as well. Um, screenshots, those can help as well. So just some handy things to keep in mind for um, when you're kind of looking at something more specific. We have reports in here. So kind of a similar thing if they're asking you about a specific report. Um, it does help if, you know, maybe they've sent you a report or even if they're asking you a report, this may help with like what you're asking of the district too, is um, have them run it with that report options page. That really gives um, you and us everything that we would need to, to know how the report was run if it has that report options page. So that can be really helpful in kind of looking into a report. Um, sometimes, you know, especially with balancing, like the discrepancy could be something with the data you need to look into, or it could just be how the reports run. So that kind of helps um, helps us both be able to narrow that down to which of those it is. And then errors. So we included a section for this. Um, I know that this is tough because sometimes, you know, they'll come to you and say, hey, I got this error. Here's the screenshot of it. Here's what it looks like. Um, when we investigate the errors, what we'll do is, you know, sometimes the, the basic er error message can tell us what's going on if we've seen it before. Um, but it does also help to have what we call the stack trace. And that is like the full detail of the error. If it ends up being something that we need to escalate to our developers, we do we are going to need to have that. So this is a good thing, like if when you're looking at it, if you go ahead and grab that. Um, so here's the information on how you can find that that stack trace. And um, if you actually have the error message, all you have to do is click these two little arrows at the bottom of it and it'll open up and you can just copy and paste that into like a TXT or a Word document. Um, or it can um, also usually be found in your application log too. So this kind of guides you on where to go to this. Um, I do have the troubleshooting um, uh, training later this month, and we'll talk a bit more about finding these um, in, during that as well. We have a note here about sensitive information. So um, the other thing, keep in mind, you know, uh, this doesn't come up all the time, but you know, if there are certain things that you're talking about, might include a social security number a tax ID number, um, W-2 reports, or um, even if you're giving us like a login to a test instance, we have ways where we can get the information securely from you. So keep in mind, don't put those in tickets because, um, you know, just for security safety. Okay, so that's kind of the basics. That's kind of the basics, like, you know, regardless, like kind of depending on what the situation is, like those are all good things to include if they're applicable. And then we kind of talk about like our different kinds. So when you go into that help desk, um, you're picking new feature enhancement, support, or reporting a bug. And so from here, we kind of break down and say, okay, you know, if it's a new feature enhancement that you're requesting, you know, what, what should you put in that ticket? And generally these are like, you know, something that the districts, you know, giving feedback, they are interested in having um, a change to something of how they use the software. And that's great. We, we log all of those. We have, you know, the feedback JIRA issues that we make. And if one exists, we also keep track of how many times those things are requested. We put a couple other bits of information in here that can be helpful. 
um, this one, how this enhancement will help. This, you know, obviously like um, it's not necessarily required, you know, we, we can make the feedback issues, but um, one thing to keep in mind is that those feedback issues, so they go to our prioritization committee. The prioritization committee is made up of districts and ITCs. There are a lot of uh, feedback issues out there at this point for them to review. So if your district is making a specific request, it can be very helpful to get a summary from them or kind of talk through with them, like how this would help them, um, you know, any additional details on their process that might be relevant, because there may be a way that that they do something where their enhancement would really help them. But if the people on the committee, you know, not every district does things the exact same way. So, you know, when the committee reviews that, if there's some way that that, you know, can specifically help them or multiple districts, if there's some more detail there that they can really consider, that can help when they're reviewing the issues rather than, you know, just like a one sentence, you know, okay, they want this updated. But if there's a little bit of why, then that can kind of help the evaluation process. So I recommend putting that in there. Um, if, if that's something that, you know, you, if that's something you can get from the district when you talk through it with them. And then optional, you know, if you're aware there's already a JIRA issue, feel free to add that in there. Um, I know some of you definitely do that, you know, go find that and then include it and say, hey, can you increase this? Uh, we do appreciate that for sure. Uh, if you don't know a feedback issue, though, if it already exists or not, you know, don't worry, like we will also go look them up. So, um, you know, whatever works there. But yeah, if you have one, that's appreciated. So, um, so that's the enhancements. Uh, we do have a note here. If you have multiple districts that request the same thing, like if you had a user group or something like that, and you have like five districts that that wanted something, feel free to put in one ticket and just let us know these five districts are requesting this and we'll make sure that we get the times requested updated. Okay, and then support, um, support is, this is more so like the catch-all one, right? Like this is, um, you know, you have a question or a situation. So um, just kind of the basics here um include a summary so we have the general information this is kind of suggestion based on that top part again whatever applies right um so the question in a summary of your question your situation um again if you have screenshots that can help um including like the specific page program or report um kind of like the general basics there um, if the question you're including is copied directly from the district's email ticket to you, I know sometimes it helps to have like their exact wording on what they're asking. Also let us know any additional information on what you've looked at so far, because if you've already looked at something or ruled something out, or, you know, maybe you looked at it, didn't rule it out, but um, you're still not sure, it can still help us to know, um, you know, what that is that you've looked at, where you're at with it. And then testing, um, so testing as well can help, um, you know, if you've gotten in. So, so actually once they, you know, report or ask you the question, um, discuss with them, take note of any specific processes that might be relevant. Again, we know that districts do things all kinds of different ways. So, you know, having some more context to, um, you know, when they ran into this question or what their process is surrounding this question uh, can really help when we are then, you know, taking that next step to dig into it. And then last is report a bug, um, you know, and, and this one too, like if you're not sure if it's a bug, if you put it in as a bug or you put it in as support, like that's fine. Um, you know, whichever one you think applies uh, most closely when, when you're reporting, um, understand sometimes these things, it's like, you know, you're not really sure if it's a bug and that's okay. Uh, so again, general information, um, description of the issue. So um, especially with like, if you think you found a bug, if you think there's something, you know, that's not working correctly, um, a description of what that behavior is. Again, like specific page program, if you have any screenshots, um, you know, if it's something they're reporting directly, you know, also let us know what you've looked at. And then recreating the issue. So this is even more important with this is um, especially, you know, maybe they got like an error or there was some part of the process where 
um, something didn't work how they wanted to. So say they're entering a purchase order and then like this part of the process that it didn't, you know, save right or it didn't do this, right? So take discussing with them when they report it because, you know, usually they're going to remember it like right away. So um, discussing with them, taking note of any actions they took directly prior to receiving that error, that can be really helpful. Um, again, we, we pull those backups, we um, try and recreate things, but especially with a bug, um, if we need to escalate it to the developers, like one thing that we're going to try and do right away is recreate that issue. So if you have those steps noted of, you know, what they did, um, pull a test instance, you know, try try those steps, see if you encounter it. That can be really helpful because sometimes, especially with the bugs, they happen in like a very specific situation. So if we just kind of do the standard process, it doesn't happen, then, it, then it's like, we got to go, you know, we got to go try and go back and figure out. So, so that can be just a tip to, um, to gathering that information uh, with your district. And then last uh, with the bugs is um, it does help to try and determine if it's a specific district or user. So like if you have one person reporting, um, you know, that something's happening and generally with like basic testing, you can um, figure this out pretty quick because if you log in as a min account and it happens with your admin account too, then um, it's something that, you know, may just be a general thing. Um, if there is a situation where there are multiple districts reporting a bug at once, so you know, um, we we hope that doesn't happen, but sometimes it does. Where you know, if there is something that starts happening and and you have a couple different districts that are experiencing that behavior, definitely let us know that. Definitely let us know that because um, you know we will we'll take that into account. Um, you know, in escalating to the developers and um, when they're testing to make sure we fix that bug that's very helpful as well. So, okay. Um, and then at the very end, we just have the resources. We have some frequently asked questions. Um, we have those links to that in the um, documentation, our YouTube, and then our training and registration. So, so um, I just wanted to kind of recap and talk through that. I hope that helps, you know, just, just because like, I feel like sometimes too, it's like, you know, you're going to enter that in and you know, I know that sometimes we'll come back and, and ask you a list of five questions and it's definitely, you know, we don't want to be inconvenient by doing that, but figure, you know, if you, if you're not sure, like what we're looking for, then how would you know? So, so we put this together and I hope this helps. Um, all right. Um, any questions about that before I move on to our, uh, June, our June items? Okay, well, so I am back on our SSDT meetings and trainings page. Um, scrolling to the bottom here to go to calendar year 23, heading to June. Okay. Okay, so I'm gonna cover USAS. Uh, for USAS, we had uh, two releases this um, in June and they were both regular releases. We had 8.74 and 8.75. Um, as far as what was on here, so we do have some stuff to recap. Uh, we had looked at a couple of things related to fiscal year end, and this first bug fix was one of them. So um, the account change process, there was a pretty specific situation where if they were in June, but they hadn't created July yet, the account change process um, at one point created the July posting period. Um, this only happened for districts if they didn't already have July, which um, if they apply their budgets ahead of time, they usually do, but not all of them. So that can't happen anymore. So the account change process is corrected. So it won't create the July posting period if they run it in June. Um, and then uh, the changes for that also resulted in performance improvements for the account change process as well. Uh, for the improvements section, uh, we did also update um, some subject code changes per ODE for fiscal year 23. And so we uh, keep tabs on these, update these as far as like what the valid subject codes are. So you're on that validation report. Um, 
for a full list, see the release notes. It's a pretty long list, so I didn't bother to put it in our recap page. Um, but yeah, if you are interested, that was in the 8.74 uh, release. All right. Next, let's talk about the budget account activity report. This is the canned version. So if you recall, what we've been doing over time is, and this has probably been, I don't know, over like the last year or so, maybe a little bit longer at this point, but we we had, you know, um, reports that used to just be template reports, and we've been rewriting them to the canned reports. You can find them on that report drop down menu. And really the goal when we started that, um, that change is because the reports that are on that, that report menu, the canned versions, um, we can increase their performance so they can run much quicker. The uh, um, financial detail report runs about 99% quicker. So it's like a huge improvement. Budget, uh, the budget summary is on there. Um, we added the budget account activity report. It's called account activity. And then there, once you open it up, there's an option for budget or revenue. So this one, when we first added it as the canned version, we got about a 24% performance improvement, which every improvement helps, but that wasn't quite as high as some of the other performance improvements that we had gotten with the other reports. So we still had this out here uh, to, to improve this one more basically. And that's what this did um, in this seven, in this 8.75 release. So uh, this was a this was performance improvements of 55 to 75 percent. That kind of depends on like how much you're running the report for. And then we also added the forecast line number as a sort option. So over here is in like the sortable properties. You can add that as like a sort or a control break. Um, and really the goal here is over the last couple months, we've had some other changes to these canned reports too. Um, so what we're kind of trying to do is um, keep hitting all of these pieces so that if there's something that is available on the template report that we don't have on the canned report yet, we're adding those. So like the forecast line number that was on the template, now it's on the canned report. And as we do this, really the goal is so that they can use the canned report for, for most things that they would need it for so that they can have the quicker report. So um, I put a little note here, you know, please make sure your users are using those canned versions of the report whenever possible, because especially if they're worried about slow running reports, you know, if they're saying, hey, this report's taking a really long time and you find out that they're using the canned version, they, I'm sorry, the template version, they can immediately try that same thing with the canned version and, and have better results. So that's like a very quick way to be able to help them. Um, obviously there are differences, you know, there are still some things with the template report that, um, that, you know, they can't do with the canned report, but at this point, as I was trying to think, and I don't think that there are too many things, um, that they can't do outside of like, if they've customized the versions, um, yes, Jake, yes, I, that is, that is another one. Um, so, uh, the customized versions, you can like add or remove columns or adjust formatting. So I understand if they're doing that maybe for like board meetings or something like that, but as far as getting information, um, they generally can can be able to use these. Jake mentions um, yesterday, um, there was a user that asked for the ability to use wildcards or ranges to get a range on accounts. So um, I do not believe that's for the financial detail, um, and we do have a feedback request for that, which um, that's excellent. If you have, you know, districts that run into things like that, let us know. These are things that the team is looking at. Um, again, we've been doing some of these uh, kind of miscellaneous improvements to these over the past couple months, even to try and make sure that we've got what we can in there. Um, the the ranges is interesting, so. With the template reports, like kind of how it works with these filters is that it's like either wildcard or ranges. So, um, and I think we talked about on Jake's ticket that the filters are a workaround. 
Um, so if they certainly do have like more complex um, filtering that they want to do, um, they can they can use those filters right now. But I know they don't want to always use those if it's just like a wild card situation. Um, but yes, so if there are other things you notice, let us know. Um, again, we're working on updating these, but um, especially if it's something that they're running like this, if they're running it for the full fiscal year, that's a pretty big report. But um, now this one has been um, increased performance as well. So, um, so hopefully that does help them with getting some of the information they need uh, quicker. <laughs> All right. Uh, next one is um, creating a rule to prevent invoicing a future year purchase order in the current fiscal year. So um, this was another one that we had looked at to get out there um, related to fiscal year processing. And so this is out there going forward. Um, basically, what this does is if they start to enter their 7-1 POs, they start to enter those like ahead of time in June, you know, because they're going to get those out there. Um, for the next fiscal year. Um, this prevents them from accidentally invoicing one of those 7-1 POs or any date in the next year um, before, like in the prior year. So the example here is the current period's June, say it's like June 15th on the calendar, and they started to create their 7-1 POs. Um, so July is also open. Then they invoice one of those POs and they let the date default to 615. So that can cause a balancing problem because the invoice would reduce the encumbrances with a June date, but those encumbrances aren't actually added till 7 1. So, um, so basically, that can't happen anymore. This rule will prevent that. It is a mandatory rule, so it can't be disabled. Um, so basically they'll get an error if they try and do this. And then in order to post the invoice, they either could change the PO date or they can change the invoice date. So, um, that'll help with that processing. We, um, updated the anonymizer to remove the, the file store data. So this is, um, something, um, I think we've had a couple other of these, um, anonymizer updates recently um we're uh working towards with uh, management council we're working towards an option to be able to get anonymized databases so this is a step in that process okay and then last thing for you sas is uh we had a patch and this was specifically for a district um we changed an account job status but um, this is one that I just wanted to mention on here. So um, what we what we saw with this situation is that they had an account change um, in progress. So it was running. So the job was out there in the job scheduler. And then the instance was restarted. So when it was restarted, the job didn't get restarted, which I believe we have another JIRA issue intending to correct that to actually prevent it from happening as well. Um, but just for the time being, I just figured, okay, well, this is a good chance to talk about it and, um, you know, kind of give you guys a heads up. If you're going to be restarting an instance, that would be a good thing to check just to be safe is to see if there if there's an account change running out there and be cautious about restarting it. So maybe wait till that account change finishes. Um, you know, unfortunately, the... Um, the uh, instance also does not, maybe not unfortunately, but the instance does also restart when uh, release is applied. So um, that may be something to watch out for as well. I'm not sure that it always happens, um, but we have seen it happen, um, I think with just a couple districts now where that restart has kind of left the account change hanging. So so just something to be cautious of, uh, but this one was, was to correct that for a district. Okay. Okay, kind of a lot of talking from me this morning, but uh, do we have any questions before we move on to the other sections? All righty. All right, I'll turn it over to you, Lori. Sounds good. Let me share my screen here. Okay. Is everybody seeing the um, release notes? Make sure I'm. Yep, 
Okay, perfect. Thank you. Okay, we'll switch gears and talk about payroll. Um, we did have three regular releases and then a hotfix that went out. Um, so we'll go over um, those. The first, um, when it comes to bug fixes, we um, noticed early on in June, um, it was reported that some um, positions were getting missed when it comes to um, being listed on the STRS advanced reports. And this was due to some changes that were made um, to try to improve performance in the reports um, and the date ranges for um, the actual positions um, that the reports were looking at um, really weren't accurate. Um, it was missing the um, actual like pay group date range part. So this, um, these reports were updated to now correctly use um, the pay date ranges and um, report that information correctly. Um, next, there were some payroll initialization validations um, that weren't happening um, when it came to special pays and when um, pay amounts were created or modified. So those um, special situations um, are now taken into consideration when a payroll is initialized and those validations are happening you know, amongst all of those different um, situations. Um, as one would expect. Next, um, we had um, a flood of emails, uh, tickets come in um, regarding some strange message that um, districts were getting um, that said cannot get high gross on a null object. Um, and this appeared on the air report after a payroll was initialized. And um, it was determined that this was created due to um, the Medicare year-to-date applicable gross being negative. Um, so it goes out and it looks at the table that's internally um, built within the software. And because that was a, a negative, um, this, this error was caused. Um, so the developers you know, quickly um, corrected that, um, and that was... Um, taken care of so that the error no longer is listed on the error report. Um, we also had a couple instances reported um, with the STRS advanced um, position report, not correctly reporting um, information for those employees that were strictly paid out of accrued wages. Or there were a couple cases where um, they were maybe paid out of, you know, you know, 19 out of 20 pays were paid out of accrued wages. So the majority of them, I should say. Um, so if that was the case, um, the software was totally um, ignoring those types of um, positions and excluding them from the report. Um, so that, again, um, was taken care of so that it now does take into consideration compensation adjustments um, for work days um, to determine whether they should be included on the report or not. So probably not, you know, real common, but we did have, um, you know, several reports of that happening and, and the developers work to quickly correct that. Next, um, there was an issue um, with the audit report failing if um, there was an account, a pay account um, that was deleted. Um, so instead of it failing now, um, you know, the report will complete as expected. Um, and, you know, the miss, those missing or deleted pay accounts won't cause any issues. And then lastly, when it comes to the bug fixes, um, there was a, a situation that was reported where um, a district was using the um, supplemental tax option um, differently on multiple uh, miscellaneous payments. So anytime miscellaneous or terminated pay types are used, those supplemental tax options have to be the same across you know, all of those um, pay types. So in this case, um, you know, the system was not catching that. Um, so it was allowing that. 
um, those types to be different. So maybe one was selected to um, apply annuities to the supplemental. Um, and then another was um, applying annuities to regular. Um, and again, those, those supplemental tax options have to be the same across miscellaneous and terminated pay types. So now instead of the system allowing that to happen, um, there's actually an error that's produced. And the error is, I've listed that, it says, you know, right away all applicable um, pay amount supplemental tax options must be the same for all positions being paid. Um, so the system won't let you go any further. It's gonna prompt an error um, and make the user then change that to be the same across those different pay types or those pay types. Okay. All right, moving right along then to improvements. Um, we, you know, as you as you know, we've talked about over multiple releases now, um, the changes that we've made to building and department codes to sort of be its own entity. And because of that, um, there's been multiple, you know, changes that have taken place um, that have involved um, that change. Um, one of the last updates um, to be made is actually um, creating those um, or copying those building and department codes when you're creating a new contract. So if you go in and you, oops, sorry, I got timed out here. Let me get logged back in. So if you're going to new contracts and you're actually copying, Go ahead and create one here quickly. Oops. Make up some dates here just to get it created. You'll see that when that um, information is copied from the existing compensation record, the building and department code are automatically populated. So, um, you know, if it's the same, then nothing needs to, you know, no changes are necessary. Um, but again, you can, you know, change that information using the drop down if um, it applies. Um, next, we, <clears throat> there was a change that was made to the SOAP service um, to um, actually match the sort order um, that's in the user, the user interface. Um, so those two sort orders um, should match now. Um, when it queries those pay accounts, it's gonna match the sort order um, that's actually in the application. Um, we also added a couple tool tips um, to the leave activity report to better um, help understand what those dates are, how those dates are working. So if I go to reports and then I go to the leave activity report and I hover over the show applied balance um, starting and show applied balance ending, you can see now we've added tool tips to hopefully, you know, clarify that, you know, uh, make it more clear exactly what those dates are um, asking for and how it's being used. So I think the key to this report, and we've tried, you know, we've put it a blurb in the newsletter. Um, we've, you know, added tool tips. Um, we're going to take that one step further. And um, we've actually um, added um, an issue that will be released on um, 6.96 to actually include the leave activity date on those attendance records. So hopefully, you know, between all of the um, little updates that we're making, um, we can help users understand this report a little bit better. So I can open up here um, an attendance record and you can see here, I can show you what's to come. The, the leave activity date is going to be actually displayed on the attendance record. So, you know, hopefully all these, these parts that we're putting in place will be um, help, you know, the user understand that report um, a little more clearly. Um, the thing that I've absolutely loved about the report is 
um, because it is, you know, keep in mind this report is showing a real live, you know, snippet of how the balance got from point A to point B. So, you know, if that attendance record, just because it was entered, when did it actually affect the employee's balance? So what I've found helpful um, when there's balance discrepancies is go to the employee's payment and on the employee's payment, um, the details of the payment, I'm sorry, um, it lists, you know, the beginning balance, the amount um, of leave that was used, and then um, the actual balance. So here's, you know, if you're you're looking at sick leave, here's the amount that printed on the employee's check that was accumulated. Here's the amount that was used, and here's the balance. You should be able to go from payment to payment and see this change. And that should flow exactly with that leave activity report. So if there's ever, you know, discrepancies in, you know, leave and, and how it got from, you know, one point to another, maybe look at the details of the payment and compare that to the leave activity report. And I found that super helpful. There are times when entries are deleted um, and, you know, you can see that clearly that the, the amount used was one value, but I'm not finding, you know, absence records um, that equal that same amount. So just a little, um, you know, kind of tip um, that hopefully you'll find helpful when you're working with districts and, you know, those leave um, balance, balancing situations. But again, we're trying to put, you know, some better tools in place to help the user understand the report a little better and hopefully these tool tips and then adding that leave activity date to the attendance records, um, which will be coming out soon, will, will help as well. Okay. All right. Um, the Another um, improvement to the audit report um, was to actually include deleted users. Um, there was information that was being omitted from the, the um, report itself, and that was due to um, users being deleted. So now um, that has been um, changed and, you know, the information will be included on the report, even if the, the user is deleted. Pay groups. Um, there was an enhancement made to pay groups um, to sort of match or flow um, like other delete options within the application. So now if pay groups are actually deleted, they're actually archived. So, you know, they're not, they're not gone. Um, they're just hidden um, and archived. So if you, you know, would want to go back and see those pay groups um, for whatever reason in the future, um, you just have to, you know, include all um, archived and that will bring those pay groups back um, to the screen and allow you to see those. The CSV versions of the wage obligation report in the employee benefit obligation report have um, been added to the fiscal year end report bundle. So um, now those are actually part of um, that fiscal year end um, reporting um, uh, group and you can see those in the file archive. Um, you know, we've we've made um, several enhancements to the salary notices, salary notice program, um, thanks to your requests that have come come in. And, and I know our developers have tried to, you know, make that as user friendly as possible because everybody wants so many different things um, printed and, um, you know, the way they want them printed on the on those notices. So they've done a really good job of trying to keep up with um, those requests. And one of the um, most recent is to add um, the printing of the, uh, the position description. So if I go to new contract and I change that position description to something um, you know, that pertains to um, the upcoming school year. So here's the field that we're talking about. And I've now changed that to be test FY24, just so it kind of stands out and we can 
take a look at how it looks on the, the salary notice. When I go to print that, you can see here that it prints that new position description. Um, before it did not do that. Um, so, you know, again, it's, you know, as those are changing, um, you know, districts probably want those to be printed um, on those salary notices or updated. Um, so that change has been made, so it will do so. All right. Um, we talked um, a little bit about the performance um, improvements to the STRS advance reports um, in the beginning of the payroll um, portion this morning. Um, but just to point out, um, you know, the advance report was improved 77%. The positions report was improved 85%. And then the advance submission was improved 78%. So these are huge increases. Um, I know we received some positive feedback right away um, from many of you saying, you know, districts notice this right away and love it and appreciate it. So um, yeah, those reports can be can be pretty lengthy because you're gathering so much information, you know, for the entire fiscal year. So, you know, clicking those buttons and, you know, having them um, complete in, in seconds is a wonderful thing. So thanks to our developers for, for improving those. Um, payroll payment checks. So there um, were a couple of different parts that were added to um, the printing part of checks and the ability to um, now include the full payment details of the report um, when, it, when it's being printed. So before you printed a check and you saw just, you know, basically like the written part of, of a check um, and, you know, users want the detail to go along with that. So this um, issue here um, allows the full payment, um, the full details of the payment to be printed. So now instead of it looking just like a written check, you can see here that it actually gives you the detail. So it gives you all the, the payroll items that were um, uh, withheld from the payment as well as you know, the retirement information and then the leave information. So it looks pretty much, you know, just like you would expect um, a check that you printed, you know, along with the regular payroll to look. Um, I did want to add, there's a couple other parts to this. Um, we did add a configuration option. So if we go to check um, reprinting configuration, this by default is automatically checked. So print full check um, is checked so that it will print the full details of those reprinted payments. Now, if for some reason, you know, districts don't want that, um, this can be turned off by just unchecking the box and then saving, and then it will revert back to just basically looking like, you know, a written check does. Um, I wanted to mention, um, because it was brought to our attention, that um, if you go to reissue a check, um, so if I go to payroll, pay, I'm sorry, payments and then payroll, and I go to the, say the, um, the tabs specific to direct deposit or payroll payment checks, and I select the reissue option, um, it's actually not allowing you to get the full details of the re of the check um, as you would expect. So this is what you're going to see if a check is reissued and it's reissued and printed from um, the payroll payments option. Now, if you go to, as mentioned here, if you go to payroll payments, um, checks, then it's going to allow you to print the full details of the check, but we're going to take that one step further. And on 6.97, um, that release, when you go to reissue um, the check, it will allow you to print the full check details as well. Um, so the two options really should be working the same um, and you know not have you 
basically go back to payroll payments checks to reprint that. Um, so users, you know, once this is released, are not going to have to take that extra step to print. Um, no matter where you are, um, what screen you're on, you will be able to print um, from either option. Okay. Um, when it comes to reissuing direct deposits, um, prior to that, you could go in and you could actually change um, the uh, account number and routing number. So if that needed to you know, be reissued and sent to a different account, um, you could do that. If it needed to be reissued to the same account, um, for whatever reason, you could, you could do that by entering those numbers but this deposit type was not available. So if an employee, you know, their um, ACH got returned for whatever reason, and it needed to be reissued, and it was, you know, a, a savings account, and it now needed to go to a, a checking account, there was no way to change that. And banks were actually rejecting um, the file because the type was not what it should be. Um, so up until um, this enhancement, you know, it, it really just reverted to what was on the original payment. Um, so now districts have the ability to change the type as well. Um, so if that's, you know, something that needs to change based on the new account information, they have the ability to do that. Um, and then lastly, when it comes to improvements, there were um, some improvements to the AOS reports. So the employee report now includes non-contract compensations. It was not including those before. Um, and then when it comes to the payment history report, it now uses the actual current employee name and numbers. Um, before, this was based on the history. So if someone changed their name or um, uh, an ID got changed, um, the history wasn't matching what, you know, what was in the current system. Um, and that was causing some issues. So now instead of looking at the history for the employee name and numbers, it's actually looking at the current information. All right. Um, when it comes to new features, we just have a couple. Um, and one is um, adding the, the posted version of the payroll leave report. So when a, a payroll is, is posted, um, you can go back then to the details of that payroll, and you can now see that leave report. So that check leave report that we just, um, you know, provided um, a, a few releases ago, um, before once you posted the payroll, there was no way to get back to that report um, unless you saved it. Now it's actually included in the details of the payroll. So at any point in time, you can go back and that report can be generated. And then lastly, when it comes to new features, um, we the developers have added a new um, employee photo entity and repository. Um, and the the photo that you photos that you see um, underneath the employees, you know, in the actual employee dashboard, um, that is going to be changed um, to make it a little more user friendly. So this is just the beginning of that process, um, so that they can start you know, working on developing and making that um, a little more user-friendly for everybody. Um, and then the patches, I, I'm not gonna go into those. Those, you know, um, Mark Davis sent out messages about those as they applied to the, um, the releases. Um, so I'm not gonna go into any details of those. Those are kind of in the past and we don't need to worry about those anymore, so. That's all I have for payroll. Um, does anybody have any questions at all? Let me check the chat. I don't see anything. Okay. I, seeing none, will turn this over to Michelle to talk about inventory. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Hoping everyone can hear me okay. Um, 
what I'm going to do is uh, just, we didn't um, have too much going on here in inventory. Um, we just had a quick um, bug fix uh, that we um, had on the 1.37 release. And that was in regards to um, the standard users being able to see the job scheduler in inventory. So if I just go over to that area, um, and that's under system configuration, um, they weren't able to see uh, the information in here. So if they're the ones that are closing the month and the report bundles being generated and they wanna see the process of that and the progress of it, um, then um, they weren't able to go in and look at the job that was running. So um, they'll be able to do that now. And that's pretty helpful since we're you know, coming upon fiscal year end with inventory. Um, so that's the only change that was made in regards to inventory. Um, one other thing I wanted to mention um, when it comes to inventory is I was being a little proactive um, <laughs> on the inventory checklist steps when I went through them with you guys back in early May um, regarding the inventory fiscal year and report bundle and um, the document uh, management and archival system isn't ready yet. Um, so we're hoping that that will be out here within the next month. So I reverted step five back to its original steps saying that um, when uh, you close the period, that inventory fiscal year and report bundle will be um, generate, you know, obviously generated and emailed. Um, so same as it was last, last year, it's going to be emailed in a zipped format to those email addresses listed underneath core configuration. So I just changed that step back to its original information here, and I apologize for that. Um, so I'm hoping, though, that once that document store, uh, document once the document management and archival is implemented, um, what is going to happen then is that report bundle will no longer be emailed. Instead, um, that bundle will be sent to the document storage, or I know that we've been calling it document store. I think we're changing it to document storage. Um, and what inventory will have is it will have a new file archive option in the inventory application where they can see their um, fiscal year end reports, very similar to what USAS and payroll have. Um, so once that does get implemented, um, you know, that will switch over and those reports will go straight to um, the document storage. Um, so once again, I apologize for that, but um, it's going to be the same old thing for now um, until document storage is in place. Any questions on that? Check my chat over here real quick. Okay, just a couple other things before we uh, wrap this up here. Um, with our, uh, our July newsletter should be coming out next week. Um, so um, we're working on that right now. And our next um, upcoming Fridays with Fiscal Sessions, we have one next week where payroll is going to be covering different ways um, to add an employee. And I think part of that process will be the onboarding process. And then on the 21st, uh, USAS will be, and I think um, Amanda mentioned this early, earlier, that we'll be covering some common transaction errors and how to troubleshoot them. Um, so that's on um, our schedule for July. I know it's extremely busy for everybody um, in regards to fiscal year end. So we so appreciate you guys, um, you know, being able to log into these sessions. And um, if not, we do record them um, so that you can review them later when you guys have some time. Um, and just to recap again, I know Amanda went through that support service desk best practices, and um, we appreciate you guys, you know, being on and just um, having her cover that with you. Um, we just felt, you know, there's so many new um, ITC staff coming on board this past year. And I know, like, you know, Amanda mentioned, we're done with, you know, the migration stuff. And um, I know right now it's really busy. Um, but it is, it's just a rush to get those tickets in. And, you know, especially for uh, the newer staff, if you're not quite sure, how, what do I put into these tickets? What all do they need? Um, I think that this document is a great way to say, okay, what kind of general information do I need? And if 
I have like an actual support question that I can go right down to the support link. And these are basically the things that are needed on the ticket. So I would definitely bookmark this page um, and reference this when you're ready to create a ticket, just to get a little better handle on, you know, the information that's going to be helpful for both of us, you know, basically for what we need to do to help you with your ticket and for you to give us all the, in, the best information um, you can on the ticket. Um, so I think that this will be a really good document um, for everyone to reference. Okay. I think that's it for um, today. Um, I appreciate everybody again being on the call. Uh, thanks again. So, and have a great weekend. Oh, maybe. I just wanted to mention one more thing. I, so I thought about it. I know we're done with USAS, but I just thought maybe this was a good opportunity to mention um, that email that you sent on Monday. So I know some people may have been out of the office on Monday or, you know, a lot of like from the weekend um, emails and stuff. But um, as far as USAS, um, and Michelle had sent an email, so you may have that in your inbox if you, um, you know, or you may know exactly what I'm talking about. But um, there was a bug that was discovered with entering budget adjustments. So if they're trying to enter a budget adjustment directly to the account for uh, June, but with a June date, it's not allowing that currently. But there is a workaround that's provided in that email. And um, we do have a JIRA issue. I believe it's in the testing stage. And I believe that we're planning to hot fix it. So keep an eye on your email for when that is released as well. Yes, I know. Thanks, Amanda, because I know a couple of people were still inquiring about it. Um, it looks like the the testers have completed um, testing it this morning. They sent a message earlier this morning. So um, we're hoping then that that gets out to you guys um, today um, so that you know they can go into the actual budget adjustments and make any of those um, changes that they need to make. So again, thank you all for your patience with that. We appreciate it. All right, everybody. Thanks. Have a good weekend.